I'm going to call the finance, uh, the Common Council, City of Plattsburgh, New York Finance Committee, uh, Community Development meeting to order uh, July 8th, 2021, 5 p.m. Uh, I will note that uh, Councillor Canales has been excused and all other members of the committee are present. Uh, first order of business, I'll take an approval of the minutes of the June 10th, 2021 Finance and Community Development Committee. Uh, motion by Kelly, second by Councillor Gibbs. Uh, any uh, changes, alterations, or deletions? Seeing none, I'll take a roll call. Or sorry, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, item two, community development and recreation. So just to give people some uh, clarification here, it's a pretty sizable uh, agenda tonight. A lot of this is updates on uh, projects. Uh, we're midway through our uh, budget cycle here, uh, 2021, and uh, updates on some budget items, uh, and then uh, some changes uh, further down the line and an update from our uh, city assessor on the recent uh, assessment um, that the city of Plattsburgh went through. Uh, item 2.1, draft resolution appointing Ethan Vincent as planner. Motion. Uh, Councillor Gibbs, second. Councillor uh, Moore. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, discussion. I'm very thrilled. <laughs> I am. And Ethan's a great employee. Um, he and Matt uh, have done a lot of really great things. I, I'm I was very sorry to see Melena go, and um, I'm very happy about this succession plan. So I'm very happy about this. Thank you. It's great. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. I have 2.2 draft resolution approving of artwork installations for Betty Little Arts Park. Motion. Councillor Gibbs, second. Councillor Kelly, discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, two point, item 2.3, draft resolution approving agreements for Violet's Home CDBG grant administration. Motion by Councillor Gibbs, second. Councillor uh, Moore. I don't know what you're listening now. <laughs> don't take it personal. <laughs> Discussion. Uh, how? Is this different from what we, we had approved a couple of weeks ago? What is this exactly? I saw the documents, but sure, there were 108 pages in our email. Yeah, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the council approved an agreement between the city and HCR governing that portion of the grants. Um, there are four parties involved here. It's the city, it's HCR, the state agency, uh, the Small, and then the Plattsburgh Housing Authority. So the council approved the first contract, the, the one that kind of governs everything else which is between us and HCR for the actual 750,000 grant funding. One of these is between the city and uh, the Vilas, I'm sorry, the city and the Plattsburgh Housing Authority, who is going to be handling a lot of the administrative work related to the CDBG grant, which is considerable, um, reviewing invoices, making sure that uh, the Vilas home is complying with the terms of the grant and uh, creating the number of jobs they said they were going to. Uh, and then the other agreement between the city and Vilas directly is a performance agreement, which obligates Vilas to create the number of jobs they're stating, which was the basis of the award of the CDBG grant to the city. Okay. And this is paid from grant administration? That's correct. correct. So it's paid out of the grant. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, so there's a number of presentation and discussion items to follow. Uh, the first one is our friends at Boyer Venom. Hello, Chris. How are you? Great. Good. Um, regarding uh, part of the DRI marketing, um, one of the DRI projects with marketing, signing and signage and branding. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. All right, so um, this is going to be basically a, the layout of how all the signage, the marketing, maybe the marketing, like the signage layouts for everything that will follow the same thing. Um, one thing before we get into it is we did a lot of research in the front of this project when it started. Um, and the, all the stuff we did told us that history was the most important thing. Everybody. That's over and over again. All the surveys we did, all the public response saying history, history, history. So taking a logo like this, which was pretty modern and, and unique, and finding the history was a challenge. But I feel like we've gotten there by taking the current colors and dulling them down and giving it like more of a historic uh, look. Um, you can go next one. So this is kind of an overall spread of all the different things. Um, you can see the, the current banners are actually out there already. That's kind of like the, the kickoff of the look that's existing. Um, so we pretty much carry that all the way through. Um, and each slide can get a detail of each, uh, each one of these you see right here. So this one is kind of a template or a rough potential of what you could have. These are for any of the uh, signs on the ground. They'll be put in the ground. For any um, any location, like the Arts Park would have one. I see the Arts parking lot would have one. Um, and these would size and fluctuate based on where they are and how far they, away they need to be seen. Um, this note, some of them will have a back, some won't, depending if there's a store behind it. In this case, obviously we don't have the store yet, but this is more like a template of what would go. So it's Arnie Bone, we talked about him a little bit, and a photo. So. If something was a commemoration like this, we'd do the same thing. We'd do a little research, get some information, a little short blurb in the back, and a photo, hopefully, to support what it's about. This is just a little more detail of, uh, of the build. Um, the theme of historic background images, you can see this one right here on the top left. It's, you probably have seen before, you can see on the wall down the hallway. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We're just really doing a light. Give it some texture, it makes it look historic, and then we're using this deep brown, also the accent the back, and uh, it's used throughout a lot of the signage. Nice. Um, these are for a vehicle signage. There's going to be three sides, this is the large size. Um, this is where we begin to start showing this little system of icons we're going to have. Um, this one actually is located over by this Busters now. This that exists. So we're taking this. We're kind of putting the, the medallion on the top to kind of note that this is even the city limits now because that's kind of an outer downtown outer loop uh, area. Um, we go into detail the size. I mean, it's a seal, aluminum, uh, well built, pretty thick. Probably you can see like a one inch frame. One of the, the current signs are bending a little bit and they're starting to give, and wind is going to be tough on them. So we thought maybe a little structure outside the hole. It stays there. Also, you'll notice the little bolts we give us the ability to. Remove and change and not that things change a lot, but maybe we decide whatever well, you know the hospital's that way, or there's a hospital sign right beside this. So let's put something else there. Like, let's talk about you know, uh, we have a lot of uh, you know, the arts park is down to the left. So I think it's a little flexibility going forward. Um, meetings the same, same thing, um, just the smaller. These are more like on the they're vehicle, but they're not, they also would work on the on, on the sidewalks as well. And then these are more like you would recognize them as kind of like street sign, about uh, parking sign size. So these also would be easy to spot. Oh, I see that. I see that picture of a boat, or I see the age, or I see the monument, and I know that that's, that's that way. But these again are for, for vehicles. Oh, so this is what we're we're at so far as size the icons go. Where we could be applying something to make them. Unique, like City Hall has got a rough drawing of it. That's an aim track, roughly what aim track looks like, and uh, that's a, what our buses look like. They're not standard buses, so I tried to add a little bit of character. Um, the strand, for example, we use, they still have that hanging walls that are actually on the, uh, the second tier. There's a picture still of the, the mess. And uh, but other ones are just trying to keep it simple. And uh, some of these do match the interpretive. I'm sorry, the um, interactive map online, which, which is important, I think, to tie it all in and make it all match. Uh, this is a, a newer piece of this whole project. We thought about for the person who's just walking down the street, you know, what light bulbs we have with black ones, 
needs to be roughly four feet high. So if you could build them really on a corner and you're just sitting there, they'll be sitting in front of you. And they'll show, you know, maybe two to four um, uh, things of interest nearby. And then also number them and then show them where it is. So if you're here, we you know the water runs that way. We know, you know, this is that um, dress code. So for things pretty much forward at that point, going that way. But, it gives you a little flexibility to get even more connections. So people could just drop the middle faster and find all kinds of different things pretty easily. Um, I don't know, Ethan, if we decide how many of those are going to be, but as of right now, just we're trying not to over sign the downtown, of course. We already have a lot of signage. And so where we've been looking at originally is the key intersections where people would be making those decisions about am I going, am I taking a left? And what is left? Is that the Kent Lord House? Is that towards the Champlain Monument? Or am I taking a right and going down closer to downtown? Where do I want to go down to Harper side? So focusing on those key connections at those key intersections where we're going to start, just to not have like a sign pollution. And these do, and these do have a French on them. Um, another thing to note here is we try to work possible. Um, you don't have to go back, but referencing the vehicle signs, a lot of those are going to be existing. Uh, foundations that we can just replace existing blue ones we've seen. A lot of this will replace things to try to cut costs. So I don't know if you've ever looked close, but these are this is the actual hardware of the current uh, signs that are blue with the arrows right now. Um, and so for those walk-up signs that we just run on, those can are going to be lightweight and easy to test the actual existing light poles, which I think will make it more doable and then you know less how less costly. Um, these are we haven't really figured out where we put these. These are a little more elaborate, um, going into detail historic wise. They're probably a couple, a couple feet wide, um, pretty tall. Uh, they would have little stories about the history of the area. Um, one thing we're proposing to try is um, can you find the logo, of the city logo in this drawing? So that might be something interesting for someone to do, and if they actually, you know. Yeah, we're still playing with that concept, but I think it'd be interesting to design a blank bag. We can probably do something and have some fun with it. Um, I'm trying to remember where I stuck it in this thing. <laughs> I believe. But anyway, so uh, that's just something there. A little Where's Waldo kind of twist to it. Um, these are, these originally were planned to be, and probably will be planned, were those actual blue signs that all multiple long arrows sticking out. And we chose those. These are pretty close, minus the content. The, the content. We're going to feature one of the um, one of the dots to talk about a little bit. So, for example, I put the railroad in here, the railroad station, and talk about the, the DNH railroad. Um, and these are also directional, kind of a bigger, more um, more exaggerated version of the little walk-up ones. Um, and we thought maybe you put a QR code there too that would bring you to the to the online um, map of this. Uh, we also thought it'd be a pretty neat place to do some solar LED lights. That way they would be lit at night. Um, but again, cutting costs to having to put on actually lit light box, which would be a lot more difficult in power there. So there is power probably nearby, but I think this would be easier to see. Um, the energy steam, um, we use the fabric on those. Uh, so they have a little more softer feel, they're not shiny. I think you guys have seen all over the um, Same with the street markers. Um, I think those are working. I think they feel vintagey. I think that was what the goal was. And I'm, I'm getting the vibe of that when I, when I see my, and it, it is striking when you see it when you know you're downtown. Um, this would be gateway signage of the city, not necessarily downtown. So for example, one day, Way over by um, the north side, past the McSweeney's and the Chamber of Commerce is one there. So the, um, the question is replacing the existing blue and gilded signs with these. Yeah. I, oh, uh, which ones? The blue ones. The blue. Yeah, the blue, right? The blue gold yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. So, and we thought we'd save the Discover Plastic thing. <laughs> I just said, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a little outside of the DRI project. Can we yeah. say that? This is right outside of the zone where the funding is, but one of the things that the DRI does allow for is some of this, this thought and planning that right. goes allowed. So it gives a kind of a template that the city could use as a secondary project after this to go and update those gateway signage. Right. Yeah. yeah, this is more proposed idea that we were going to change and this would be where we go. We had a lot of resistance. 
Um, this is a newer concept. The all the existing um, historic, uh, what do you call it? The interpretive, the interpretive handles that you see yeah. across the downtown. There's a variety of different kinds. And one of the things we want to do as we, you know, Chris already showed some of the new interpretive signage that we would have. But one way to take the existing signage that we do have and convert it more to the brand and the look and feel that we're trying to create for the downtown are these toppers that Chris will be able to explain. Yeah, so basically they're they're steel. And what would happen is they would mount way to the back. So it wouldn't have to be any new new construction done to the existing um, boards. So that way we were thinking like a the, the same black leaves all, all along the pencil by seven, it's almost like a deep, deep brownish black. Um, and these would be dyed, these would be by laser cut out or uh, uh, jet cut. And that way they'd be power coded and last pretty much a long, long time. And I think it would be more of a, hey, look over here. Because it says discovered history, which is kind of obvious, but a lot of these things, they're, they're about this whack. So if you were looking across the way, you'd see, oh, look at that. Bring more attention and also bring the city logo and the, the top of our views throughout uh, the character. Um, this is another pretty concept of how to use the values put into the ground. How exactly there's no like, ideas of like cutting versus replacing a whole block. Um, this you want to keep simple based on what you consider earlier about having too much. You know, I mean, people want to like, be careful on that line, but. There would be one of these just for the main, I think it said main historic, like plaster related things. And you could go from one to the next and follow them all. And that would pretty much um, be kind of tour downtown pretty easily. Um, yeah, so it'd be right in the ground. And I guess that's it. So yeah, that's where we're at at this point. Any questions, folks? Council? It looks good. No, it, look, it looks great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Uh, 2.5 presentation uh, Bartman and Jews CMF, uh, sorry, CFA plans and other grant opportunities. Hit the lights, please. Thank you. Well, um, Mayor, good to see you hey, again. How are you? Good, good. Um, Jeff, good to see you again, too. Um, I don't think I've met um, many of many others of you, but my name is Bob Murphy with uh, Barton and Lejudis. Uh, we were retained um, to assist the city with grant writing and administration, um, uh, I believe in May. And um, so uh, it was a quick ramp up to get ready for the CFA deadline, which is coming up. That's kind of been our focus um, as far as prioritizing what grants make sense. Um, what are the, the hot button issues um, that we can tackle now? Uh, what do we need to avoid so we don't hamstring ourselves later on for other priorities, such as implementation at Harborside? Um, so um, as part of that, the uh, mayor indicated that uh, a key priority was uh, City Beach. Um, so uh, we met, um, Barton and Judas met with Saratoga Associates um, to discuss uh, their update to uh, different implementation measures as part of their feasibility study, cost estimates, um, what made sense to go after first. There's over $50 million in improvements in their plan from 2016. Uh, what what are the, the first things to bite off? We can't obviously bite off the whole thing at once. Um, and as part of that, we pulled out two uh, projects uh, to pursue funding for right off the bat. Um, and both of them really go toward um, fortifying City Beach as a regional destination for what it is, um, a place to, um, to enjoy time on the beach, to stroll, to picnic, and to get access to the water for swimming and uh, car top boats, um, and, and the amenities that, that are associated with that. Um, so that was kind of our, our primary focus in that feasibility set. There are a lot of other ideas to kind of build upon that, um, uh, other kind of showstopper ideas, but we thought let's just, let's just fortify um, what it is uh, as a beach destination, attracting people from across the border um, down in throughout the region as well. So um, those two projects were uh, um, straightforward amenities, um, improving the, the restroom facilities, uh, the uh, cabana building, um, parking areas, uh, drainage, um, as well as signage, picnic areas, um, 
uh, and, and uh, trash receptacles and, and those sorts of amenities. Um, to go along with that, uh, it was noted that the beach loses a lot of sand from the wind coming um, out of the south on the lake, blowing it into the parking area, into the drainage areas, um, and leaving the beach where it's most valuable. So uh, the second project will be a beach restoration shoreline stabilization project um, submitted through uh, the Depart Department of Environmental Conservation's Water Quality Improvement Program. Um, the, the, the first grant I mentioned, that, that is through the uh, Environmental Protection Fund Office of Parks, Rec, and Historic Preservation Grant Program. Um, we're still pulling together budget figures for these. Um, notably, the amenities, uh, Saratoga Associates is updating all their figures um, uh, for, for 2021, and we'll be pulling items from there if that makes sense. Uh, the maximum grant under that program is $500,000. Uh, the city of Plattsburgh qualifies for a hardship um, uh, funding allowance, so local match would only be 25% as opposed to 50% if you did not meet that poverty threshold. So um, uh, we haven't, again, we haven't figured out the numbers yet. Um, as far as how much we're applying for, max is 500, local match will be 25% of total project costs. With the shoreline stabilization, uh, grant, uh, which would include dunes, um, sand fencing, uh, native plantings, um, and, and working that in with those new amenities that we're proposing as well. Um, I should also mention that it wouldn't be dunes all the way across. We would mix in, um, you know, openings to access and view the beach, um, and we wouldn't touch the old growth trees that are very close to the, uh, to the break wall. Um, and the maximum grant there is also $500,000. Um, DEC in that program does their match a little differently. Um, so it's not a, a percentage of total project costs, it's a percent of the grant award. So with that, there's a lot of uh, algebra involved there, but um, the maximum, so it's 25% like of, grant, of grant amount. So maximum grant is 500,000, the max, uh, match would be $125,000 because it's 25 it's 25 percent of the grant amount not of the total project cost anyway that's uh, a lot of numbers but um, those are those are the two we decided to pursue these are due um, July uh, 30th um, we have gotten a jump start on them again like I mentioned we're, we're waiting on the uh, cost estimates and concepts from Saratoga Associates for the amenities we've begun to um, uh, develop those costs for the shoreline stabilizations our, ourselves, um, and uh, we're you know we're on track to to have that ready for submission. There are some required documents we'll be working with Ethan uh, and Matt on um, to to make sure that those are accounted for that the city has. We need to get um, you know chief of those for the shoreline stabilization side being a uh, beach sanitary study uh, or report rather, which just basically says that the um, the water is safe to swim and they don't want to fund beach stabilization where it's not safe to swim. So uh, we're working on that. Um, as far as what else will be needed, uh, will be um, local support, indications of local support. So that ranges from uh, uh, resolutions at the city council level to letters of support from users, citizens. Um, you know, I always say with letters of support, it's not really that important to get your state senator um, or Congress people to support uh, a grant project, they support a lot of grant projects. Funding agencies like to see actual users support them. So user groups, whether they're swim clubs, kayak clubs, outdoor enthusiasts, or just uh, you know PTA groups, um, um, users who are, are going to benefit from from these improvements. So um, those will be things that we'll be you know working with community development to 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 get to help fortify the application. So um, those are the two for now. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the onset, um, we didn't want to um, hamstring ourselves later on. We've already identified uh, the local waterfront revitalization program and green innovation grant program as possible fits for harbor side implementation, which we want to be able to apply for next summer. Um, and we've also um, identified different projects in the DRI that might need next step funding. 
Um, and there are some still some missing pieces for this round. So we figured next next year will be the time to really leverage that DRI with DRI projects. All of the grant programs available in the CFA um, award extra points for projects that leverage DRI projects. So if there's um, a streetscape project that needs more funding, the signage project that, that Chris presented, um, you know, maybe perhaps sign the signage that's outside the DRI boundary, uh, the, the programs in the CFA would award it those extra points because it's leveraging uh, the wayfinding study that was that's being done right now. So um, those will be targeted for next year under, under those uh, programs. Um, and then lastly, because it's been kind of a get up and run pretty quickly um, on both Harborside and uh, the CFA programs, I haven't had the chance to sit down with uh, several department heads yet uh, to identify their needs because um, there are grant programs available throughout the year, not just through the CFA um, that we'll want to pursue. So, um, you know, I'll be having those conversations over the next couple of weeks um, and building that list of priorities from different department heads and, and moving some of those forward at the appropriate time. So um, that's pretty much my update on, on the CFA front and our, and our overall strategy there. It's still a work in progress on the overall strategy because we need to have those conversations with the other department heads, uh, but we're off and running um, with some, I think, some important and competitive applications. Any questions? Oh, well, that sounds great. I, I do have a couple of questions that are not related to the, the content that you've presented tonight, but um, I, I came across a note I made for myself last year, and I had brought this up last year to the last mayor, and I thought this would be an appropriate time to bring it up um, here that uh, because you're working on grant opportunities and working on signage and so forth. So um, a gentleman from the community who's a retired teacher had contacted me last year to uh, make me aware of some of the historical components of the lake um, and suggested something be done with the riverbank side of Fort Brown, um, suggested doing something about raising the Spitfire, which I guess is a sunken ship in, in the bay and getting the 1814 ship pulled from Whitehall. So I don't know um, if that's if any of those things are something that we could look into um, at some point as uh, continuing to work on that harbor side and the history and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So I wanted to at least put that out as something to consider um, when you're, I don't guess, I guess it would be after you're finished with the harbor side work. I guess that's, how, that's what I would say, but. De definitely will, you know, on harbor side, we're gonna to wanna to incorporate those historic elements um, and there is funding to do those sorts of things, um, especially when there's a plan and public participation to back it up, which we hope to have, you know, fortified with the Harborside plan. So, um, you know, we have some um, preliminary designs on Harborside. Um, it, it calls for a uh, historic demonstration area with, with the raised Spitfire, perhaps. Um, you know, the public likes that idea. There's a lot of support for it, indicated at the public meetings. Next year, we can go to EPF um, uh, Office of Parks, Rec, and Historic Preservation and say, look, this is an idea. We vetted it through the public. Um, we've already got other monies um, going toward this site. Uh, this is the next logical step. And it's a significant piece of historic, um, uh, 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 I guess, a historic uh, uh, rec to bring up. Um, this really add a lot to the Harborside site from a historic perspective. We're going to have a lot with the ecological perspective with the water resource recovery facility there. Mm -hmm. this, this can really be maybe the centerpiece for the historic side. So um, what I like to preach is that it's it's a, kind of a continuum that supports a grant application from okay. you know, concept to uh, building public support for it to get it. I would love to see that. Um, I was also approached by a, a friend of mine, a colleague who uh, inform me that there's uh, an historic site where the Witherill Hotel used to sit downtown, which I'm not familiar with at all. And I brought that to the mayor a little while ago. Um, and I don't know if that's something that could also be worked on, you know, in, in, with all this. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, to answer that, I guess, if that's correct. Um, you know, that's a good example of those interpretive signs. Yeah. Chris was showing the taller version and that might be uh, the Arlington yeah. home site is Right. Um, that hotel was in a downtown for a little over 100 years. It's a major focus. Um, so that'd be a good chance to celebrate that history that from the mayor. And that people can incorporate whether they're stopping there to their downtown or shop or like the 
So uh, when Ira Barbell was on the council, he had brought this up last year about creating more interpretive signs for the historic markers and events all throughout the city. I would really love to see that. Yeah, um, I'd also say there's funding outside of the CFA window for items like a historic inventory um, where maybe we can establish a list if there's not one um, that's updated just yet. Um, those are usually in March time. And then that will really inform a, a bigger grant request in summertime through uh, Office of Parks and Rec. So. Okay. We could also prioritize fixing uh, one of the most historic important buildings in the city of Plattsburgh, City Hall. Yes. Just fix our steps, yes. fix our roof. Yeah, I agree. Do some painting. You know. City Hall is in desperate need of yeah, some absolutely. love. But it, but it fits inside that broader context of our history and preserving mm -hmm. our history and highlighting it. So. I believe City Hall is on the National Register. It is. Because mm -hmm. that's that's good. It's it's difficult to get funding for municipal buildings often, but because it's on the historic register, there's an there's an in there. If it's just a regular town hall, yeah. it's hard to get funding. So okay. any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, any DRI updates, Matt? Um, Certainly, but um, so Bob can uh, the road if yeah, yeah, no, yes, just jump right into our side update. Now. Oh, perfect, yeah, thank oh. you, yeah, our side, sure. So, and um, yeah, time. sorry, folks didn't realize Barton and Judas are also the people that was selected as part of that RFP process to uh, execute our Harborside master plan. Uh, we did have a, an initial kickoff last week, was it? Mm -hmm. it was about 10, 15 people here or so. Yeah, yeah um, we, we had the uh, Harborside Master Plan Committee kickoff meeting on Friday, um, which actually was, I, I thought, a great meeting. Um, we came together with our team, which is Barton and the Judas, Aubertine and Courier, who are already working um, at the uh, Water Resource Recovery Facility on facade uh, renovations, um, as well as um, Forward Planning, who are economic development analysis specialists. And they're kind of our, um, our uh, QAQC, um, uh, true thing, as I think uh, Todd Poole called it. Um, they're gonna evaluate our proposal or proposed concepts for cost benefit analysis. They're gonna be like, well, that's great. We have this great um, grassy area, but maintenance over time, that might not be worth it. Uh, is there a hardscape solution? You know, items like that. So. Um, that's what forward planning brings to the table. We also have a uh, heavy um, exhibits on the table or on the team rather who specialize in exhibit space design, which is going to be a, uh, a key piece to that environmental learning center, which is the centerpiece of, of the harbor side site. So um, we brought our team together with the committee and the city and the committee was, um, I think, uh, really well informed on the project and came from different perspectives um, from you know, lifelong residents to members of the university community um, to uh, outdoor enthusiasts so and, and all had really good ideas to bring to the table at this stage it's really about idea collection um, make sure we understand the expectations of the committee um, of the funding source department of state um, and some limitations we might have at the site. Um, one of the things that I stressed at the kickoff meeting is that our consultant team, we bring some experience from elsewhere. Um, you know, we have different expertise that will lend itself well to design of this project, um, but we'll never know the city or the site as well as the community does. So they're really uh, setting our course, our direction. We're kind of, um, you know, the rudder a little bit, steering it. The way they want to go, but they're they're piloting our ship here. So we have the kickoff meeting. Um, we've gathered a lot of information. I was just looking through it before the meeting here today. Um, you know, we'll be looking to incorporate some of the, the wayfinding signage that Chris had brought up earlier as well. That's going to be a key piece to Harborside um, is uh, getting folks down there, uh, letting them the, you know the way down there and <laughs> how close it is really to downtown. Um, so we'll be gearing up for our first public meeting in the fall. Um, at this point, um, we're, we're, we're still gathering those initial ideas. We're putting together our, um, our mapping um, and we'll be producing kind of high level conceptual designs to be able to bounce that off the public at our first public meeting. So 
Um, that, that's a big piece of the project as well is, is um, public workshops. So, um, you know, it's, exciting. it's an exciting project. I think our team um, um, brings a lot of different expertise to the table. And like I was saying that the LWRP committee did a really good job of, of informing and directing us where, where to um, direct our efforts. So it was a good kickoff. Are, are council familiar with that LRAP, the LRAP report that came out in what, 2017? 2016, I think. 2016, yeah. yeah. 400 something pages that outlines specific subsections and sub areas of, of the city's waterfront. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not, I mean, I, I'll make I know sure, it exists, yeah, but I, I can't I'll make, it, I'll make sure it. it's available. I have, it, you know, I have a link that I can point people to uh, that's uh, available online. Okay. Uh, it's quite comprehensive. And when you look at Harborside, um, it outlines the pros and cons, the benefits of development and uh, that area specifically. But it also outlines all of our waterfront up the river. We'll, we'll be referencing it extensively in the yeah. city beach applications as well and um, try not to duplicate efforts too. Um, we don't want to have the same amenities at city beach that are at Harborside. Um, then you're just splitting um, your priorities there. So, um, you know, having that kind of holistic view that's in that report would be important. As, as well as the LRAP, as much as the LRAP is uh, uh, driving the conversation for a Harborside master plan. It's driving the conversation for a comprehensive master plan. Drove the conversation for the 2016 waterfront feasibility study that Saratoga is now turning to implement. Uh, it really is a foundation, uh, foundational document for development uh, within the city of Lachie. It'd be, it'd be good to become familiar with that. And with a lot of grant applications that are graded on described series of metrics, a uh, municipality with an adopted LRAP gets additional points attached to any project that is included in our LRAP. And Saratoga is currently shepherding our LRAP through the adoption process at the state level. Uh, it takes about a year, uh, but we're working towards that so we'll have to find next year. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, DRA updates? Yeah. Yep. <coughs> Uh, so for the DOI, uh, of course, the council is aware of the status of the Turkey Street project currently in litigation, and I'll defer to Dean for the current status of where that stands. Uh, for the Streetscape and Riverfront Access project, um, construction for the Arts Park uh, is still ongoing. We expect completion of that project by the end of July at this point, weather permitting. Uh, the remaining streetscape and riverfront access projects, the riverfront walk and the improvements to Durkin Street, those are tied up with the schedule for the Durkin development project because all of those construction timelines are going to have to align in order for everything to fit together well and not get in each other's way while they're building it. Uh, for the downtown grant program, this is the individual grants to property owners. Uh, we actually got our first reimbursement this morning for that project from the state. Um, several other projects are in various stages of completion and we are trying to push uh, as many of those property owners to finish up by the end of this year as possible. Uh, for the marketing signage and branding project, uh, Chris gave a, a pretty good summary of where that stands. Um, we've got some decisions to make about, you know, what to do with the funding that remains, you know, fabricating signage with this type of that, uh, but we'll certainly consult the council as, uh, as those discussions continue. And am I missing anything? Yeah, Dodge Street's done, been done for two years. And so it's slowly, slowly winding down the DRI. So, um, you know, we had, we had spoken in council last year uh, because of the COVID crisis and um, money becoming uh, tight in Albany, uh, concerns about getting reimbursed from the DRI or for DRI funds, is, is that something that we should be concerned about or is there any way you can comment on that or? Uh, for, you know, several of the projects are eligible for periodic reimbursement and we submit uh, requests on a quarterly basis. And, you know, they always request clarifications and additional information, uh, but we have never had a request denied. Uh, so that money has been coming in steadily. 
Uh, several of the projects are based on reimbursement once the project is completed. Um, we have several outstanding projects in that category that require board approval from the funding state agency and then a rather lengthy grant reimbursement process beyond that. Um, we're working with the states. Uh, three of those applications I know were approved by the ESD board in January. We've received one grant disbursement agreement. We're waiting for the other two. It's just a cumbersome and, and drawn out process. But we have had nothing that would indicate to me that we have anything to worry about when it comes to reimbursement. Okay, thank you. Yep. Matt, I have a question. Uh, there was an establishment downtown that uh, I guess obtained a grant for uh, building a food hub, I think, I think it was called. Mm -hmm. Was that part of the DRI? That was actually a separate program uh, through the DRI, but it was awarded to the North Country Food Co-op, which after considerable back and forth determined that they were not in a position to move forward with that grant. Uh, so those monies were folded into the pot of money that was used for the downtown grant program. And the bulk of that money was used to fund the relocation of the farmer's market uh, because it was a similar goal with increasing food availability to the public. That was a half a million dollars, right? It was, I thought it was like 260. Yeah, it was around 250. And all of that, I assume, or most of it went to the farmer's market. That's correct. Another okay. project that was also funded at a similar time was the DGP was the 14 Market Street, which is the building, the multiple commercial building house that owns that. So the plan for that building is to the building brewery space so that it fits into that, you know, food processing uh, goal, as well as um, renovating the interior, the exterior, and converting a commercial space into a food related restaurant. So that is currently the way it's part of. And that, you guys can walk down there and see that. Just go in the West Hillcom building and there's work going on. Oh, okay. Let's see if, let's see if yeah. it's doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any further questions about DRI updates, DRI projects? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Harborside plan was updated. Any, any updates on the comp plan? Yeah, for the comp plan and the zoning code updates, um, Saratoga Associates provided us with a first draft of the comp plan a few weeks ago. Uh, we went through an internal review process, gave them a, a number of comments. Uh, we've had some subsequent discussions with them about which of those comments could reasonably be incorporated with the funding that we have left available under that grant contract. Uh, a similar situation with the zoning code. It, between the LRAP, the comp plan, the zoning code update, it's about $110,000, $120,000 in grant funding, which is not enough to do a complete rewrite of the zoning code. And you can spend as much money as you want on a comp plan, uh, but we're down to what can Saratoga uh, complete with the funding that they have left? And is there any additional work that city staff would like to contribute to try and tie up some of those other loose ends to try and get the best final product, uh, you know, to present to the council here within the next couple of months? Okay. Any further questions on comp plan zoning code updates? Uh, bike path plan. So right now on Sunday, Courtney and I, and I with help with the mayor, we're scheduling a community ride. Um, that ride will be going from um, Penfield Park to Peter Blumet Park. Um, it's just to kind of get a wheels on the ground experience of some of the some of the roads that we've highlighted as part of that bike plan, uh, bike friendly plan. Um, and then at the at the at the park, the the idea is to get public feedback on. Some of the recommendations to really get an idea is, you know, is it are the lines that we drew and the data that we collected is that relevant? Is there anything that we missed? What what it changes can we make? So just a chance to get some more public feedback. Um, after that, we'll be able to tweak the plan as needed a little bit, and then we'll move forward with the implementation, which is first looking for outside funding sources. There's a People for Bikes grant that could award up to ten thousand dollars. It's not. Uh, not a municipal grant, but it's an outside agency, private entity that we could apply for sometime later in July, at least for a letter of interest. And I could get up to $10,000. It's like a 50% match. 
So exploring those funding opportunities and then working with DPW on their paving schedule and figuring out what exactly, what parts of that phase one can we implement as soon as possible and what do we need further strategic, strategic, strategic planning for, excuse my pronunciation. So. A significant amount of work and I've already heard from area planners that they were, when they looked at the plan that's been presented, the draft plan, they were looking at, they were looking for some type of like seal of an engineer or a, a separate planning firm that we hired, but uh, when they saw that it was done by the city of Plattsburgh, it was very impressive and we've had a lot of positive comments on uh, on the proposal itself. Uh, a significant number of uh, uh, vice clean members of our community have participated in the survey leading up to the recommendations. Uh, I've had a number of people reach out to my office saying, hey, how can we support? What can we do? Uh, even how can we fast forward uh, into the second, third phases of this? Uh, potential plan. Uh, but I do invite you all, invite everybody else to come out, go for a bike ride on Sunday. Sunday, 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. Kentfield Park. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any discussion on the YMCA, any updates or uh, recommendation for uh, facility improvements? Uh, uh, that's could potentially be a very long list, but the things that we're looking at uh, in the immediate future are some repairs to a lot of the windows that have been busted out over the years at the gym. Um, the lease agreement that the YMCA signed with the city uh, obligated us to spend up to five grand in capital improvements to try and improve air quality um, and air circulation throughout the building. Uh, there's considerable work that could be done to the roof and any number of other repairs to the building. Um, it's a question of, you know, what kind of investment does the council want to make in that building going forward and whether that funding is going to be available. So it's certainly a discussion worth having, uh, and I can certainly gather more details uh, and some specific prices that the council is interested in that. In general, I mean, we've you know, certainly heard a lot this year about the city taking care of the assets that we have. And, you know, considering that the rec center is one of those assets that we're hoping to generate revenue from for at least for its useful life. I, I, I don't think it would hurt to go through and see what type of uh, improvement projects uh, we could start to chip away at, you know, it, a lot of the people on this council have said, let's be good landlords. You know, I think that's part of that is taking care of the things that we have. So it, at the very least, knowing what to take care of and how much it's going to cost doesn't, doesn't hurt us. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Okay. Uh, any updates on beach number passes issued? Uh, I know I got a, a, a number from Sylvia today. Yeah, hold on. I got the, yeah. Uh, so. We had 2,000 passes printed. We gave 500 to the town of Plattsburgh issued their own residence. 100 went to the city clerk. Uh, Sylvia's office has issued 58 as of it was Tuesday. We've issued 461 from the front gate of the beach for a total of 519. Uh, that is for a total of total revenue as it stands as of Tuesday was $3,491 which when you look at a comparative period from 2019, when we had Canadian traffic, uh, the estimated revenue at this point in the season was about $27,000 uh, because we do not charge city residents for entry. We do not charge town residents for entry. The only people we have been charging this year were closed are anyone who lives in the local area who just doesn't live in the city or the town. Uh, as of earlier this week, we had charged approximately 6% of all visitors to the beach for entry. So it's one of the consequences of that policy and we're looking at, especially if the border is closed until July 21st or whatever the date ends up being when they open up, a very low year for revenue to the beach. Which is expected, right, so. Any other questions about the beach? Well, last year we didn't spend any money at the beach to speak of, did we? Uh, we very no but yeah. So, but this year we've got a full cadre of lifeguards and 
Uh, we're going to lose a lot of money on the beach this year, is what it sounds like. Most likely, yes. Okay. Any further questions? Thank you. Uh, Three point one draft resolution authorizing insurance renewals. Motion. Uh, Councilor Kelly, second by Councilor Gibbs. Discussion. Standard insurance renewals. Uh, that was on, one of the longest documents we've ever been asked to read. <laughs> that one <laughs> was a good one. Yeah. Uh, uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, 3.2 draft resolution authorizing budget transfer general fund economic development zone harborside master plan. Motion. Uh, Councilor Gibbs, second. Councilor Kelly, discussion. Uh, this is a reimbursement to the general fund for the uh, uh, granted uh, monies to implement the Harborside Master Plan. We'll talk about a little bit more in depth of those uh, unappropriated budget uh, expenses, which this is included in that, which is a reimbursement to that larger number. <clears throat> Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, discussion for the June uh, monthly finance report, cash budget, or sorry, sorry, cash balance and month uh, and report unappropriated budget and corresponding expenditure reports. What is the uh, what is in the general fund right now? Uh, as, in terms of what unappropriated? Uh, yes, I guess that's what I'm asking. Uh, three times three. In terms of surplus. Where am I looking? Oh, well, Oh, I'm looking at the last year. So we have 1.9 in the general fund right now. Is that what this says? Yeah, oops, Am I reading that correctly? Uh, in general, uh, total funds in our general checking, it's four or it's 8.4. If you look at the cash balance minus the, uh, if you look at cash balance minus the surplus, it would be about about the same 4.4. Uh, that is unappropriated, uh, non-budgeted funds. Uh, the remaining is the four million allocated for budgeted items. That surplus is still remains pretty healthy for the city. Also, per the per the request about how much money we spent that hasn't been budgeted, if you will, um, that is the 2021 unappropriated budget adjustments. Uh, that spreadsheet that or that outline that's been provided. Uh, totals about four hundred and eighty-nine thousand uh, dollars. That amount, that amount in total, uh, minus the hundred and nine uh, that was reimbursed, uh, reimbursable uh, from the DOS uh, grant funding, uh, leaves that amount at three hundred and seventy-nine thousand dollars that's been spent. That's unbudgeted. That's been spent. Um, if you break that down into different categories of spending, uh, 83,000 of that was uh, emergency spending, uh, meaning it was like, for example, we just approved uh, replacement of pumps, some pumps at the uh, uh, police department. Um, there was a number of contracts last year that were signed, uh, but were unfunded. Um, uh, let's see, park improvements, which is the biggest uh, number that we spent, uh, that's 286,000, uh, which includes uh, the demolition of the three buildings, uh, deferred maintenance, updating some deferred maintenance issues. Repairing the building or allocating funds to repair the building across the street. Expanding the dog park 
at the city beach. Uh, some of the emergency spending was also the IT allocations that were provided for disaster recovery, which weren't expected, but um, became an emergency pretty quickly. Uh, there was independent board expenditures uh, that covered legal fees, uh, a number of infrastructure investments or infrastructure spending, uh, unexpected spending uh, for the activated charcoal or activated carbon, I should say. So in total, the, the surplus that we built up uh, with the additional sales tax uh, and other funds still remains pretty healthy. And from the mid-year report, we can see we're still ahead on our revenue numbers in the general fund, Rex complex, Rec complex, parking, sewer, library, running a bit of a, uh, a deficit or an overspending in water uh, due to the number of the infrastructure spending that needed to be done upfront. Uh, if you turn the if you turn that first page on here, mm -hmm. you can see compared to last year where things are at. So we're running pretty close fifty percent to what we expected to spend this year already. Barely exceeding the parking lot budget you know, in terms of revenues. So overall, we're you know our spending is pretty much on track with what we had budgeted. But as we noted, you know, rec complex is going to be, especially at the beach. Um, let's not discount the American Rescue Funds uh, that we do have uh, in that we certainly can plan to offset loss of revenue due, due to COVID. That is a caveat to spending that money, uh, to accepting that money and using that for lost revenues as well as infrastructure projects, uh, uh, emergency um, essential service uh, payroll as well. So that will help uh, chip away at that general fund uh, expenditure. Just a reminder that the budget season is rapidly approaching us. So mm -hmm. it's for, keep that in mind that when we get this all done on time, there's budget for October. October 7th, I believe. Um, and as I did send out an email to everybody today, um, we will start that process uh, probably within the next couple weeks. Uh, and as indicated, uh, chairs of committees that those departments report to will be invited into those discussions uh, with the department heads regarding developing those budgets. Uh, uh, subsequent uh, to uh, developing the budgets, we'll have a series of public hearings uh, with the full council open to the public with the department heads to then outline and discuss how those numbers came about how those recommended, recommended uh, budgets will come about. Uh, and then any updates or changes or recommendation, recommended changes that come out of those public hearings will be made back to the budget and then will be submitted uh, before the official uh, October uh, deadline for presenting the mayor's budget to the council, to the public. A lot of numbers to pick through. I understand that. Um, yeah, a lot of numbers to pick through. Okay. okay thank you. Uh, 4.1 has been withdrawn. 
uh, 4.2 draft resolution uh, reappointing Scott Domain to Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, this is more, um, maybe the language or the title is a little inaccurate. This is more about appointing Scott to be uh, to the chair uh, person of the Zoning Board of Appeals with the understanding that uh, Mr. Nolan is not stepping down uh, or resigning from that position from the board, but is retaining his current appointment um, as appointed two years back to one year back, reappointed one year back. Who was that originally? Uh, no, reappointed last year. Yeah, it's a five year term. Yeah. Right. 2024. I'm not Probably so 2019. Yeah, so the, the the point of this is to appoint Mr. Demain to uh, the chair position of the zoning board with the understanding that Ron is retaining his voting position uh, as an appointed, already appointed member. Take a motion. Motion by Councilor Moore, second by Councilor Gibbs. Gibbs, discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. Uh, item 4.3, draft resolution appoint, appointment of Daniel Herb to Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, to be a, to clarify this, um, uh, the uh, language here should not say regular member, it should say alternative uh, member of the Zoning Board. Motion? Take a motion for a vote. I'll, I'll make that motion. Second. Can I second to bring it? I'll second to bring it to the floor. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? I'm opposed. Okay. opposed. Jennifer, opposed? Opposed. Okay, four opposed. Uh, it does not get moved. Uh, 4.3 draft resolution authoring dissolution of the Plasburg Progress Local Development Corporation. Motion. Councilor Gibbs, second. Councilor Kelly, discussion. I could just give a, a very quick update. Um, we did get a Resolution from the sole remaining director of that LDC uh, seeking to dissolve, and also he provided a plan of dissolution. So that was a necessary, potentially necessary step in order for the council to take this action. Any further discussion? Roll call. Oh, I'm sorry. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? <laughs> Carried. Uh, I did have uh, Mr. Zerpinski come to talk about the assessment update. Thank you for waiting patiently, if you don't mind. Uh, last year, about the same time, I believe, uh, Mr. Zerpinski came to talk to the council regarding assessments, uh, assessment process, uh, updates to the assessment uh, this year, uh, and uh, they invited him back because we just wrapped up our, did we submit our official See, uh, certified final state. role was filed final July role. 1st. Okay, July 1st. July 1st is when the final role goes into effect. Okay. Thank you. So, this year we looked at for those of you who may be new to the, the council, the city is broken up into sales neighborhood districts. And the sales neighborhood districts that were looked at and revalued this year were the center city, the French Quarter and the Old West End. The Old West End is largely west of campus and goes up the hill to about Kogan Avenue and consists of mainly post-World War II construction. Um, there's also houses that fall in that neighborhood that are also at the end of Prospect, the end of Beekman, and some at the end of Bailey. Overall, there were 1,900 change of assessment notices that went out the city's increase in, in taxable value was roughly about $24 million. Um, 
So when I say taxable, the assessed value actually went up higher, but there are exemptions that individuals have either for senior exemptions, veterans exemptions, and those chip away at some of those numbers to get to the taxable value. Next year, with the market that we're looking at, July 1st is when we cut off our sales every year so that we have time to analyze them for next year. So not only does the final rule get filed July 1st, but we also take all the sales from last year, add them to the pile and say, okay, what happened? And if anybody's been paying attention to the housing market, it's been very robust. Mm -hmm. So basically everybody that did not get revalued this year is guaranteed to get revalued next year. Now, I thought that um, assessments could only be done once every five years. Mine got done twice, two years in a row. So here's the thing. If the values of the properties that are selling are greater than 5% away from what I have them assessed at, that triggers a reassessment. It triggers it's just a automatic. Reassessment. Yep. Yep. So in quiet years, <laughs> we'll say 14, 15, 16, 17, things started to move a little bit. Nothing had to happen during that time period because what was selling was within that 5%. But then as the market started to move, so did also assessments. And I don't know where it's going to end. Um, there are properties that I have raised this year that have already sold for more than the price that I just increased them to. So as far as I'm concerned, the game is still afoot. As I said the other day, people are willing to take their hard-earned money and invest in the city of Plattsburgh by moving to the city of Plattsburgh. Mm -hmm. That is an encouraging thing. If they're willing to pay their mortgage for 30 years and pay their taxes for 30 years to live in the city of Plattsburgh, kudos to the city of Plattsburgh because it tells me that people want to live there. Mm -hmm. Whereas if every other house was for sale and nobody was buying, that's the sign of trouble. We have exactly the opposite of that. We have people that are fighting one another to try and get houses in the city. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm seeing that in my neighborhood. Houses uh, for sale for days and then gone, sold. If you take the old West End, there's approximately 1,800 <laughs> parcels in that neighborhood. In the past three years, even without adding in the last year, there's 800 parcels. There was 87 valid sales. That's one in every 10 house has turned over ownership in the past three years. And it will probably increase. The other thing is, is that when I ran the numbers for the average sale price three years ago in the city of Plattsburgh, it was $145,000. This year, it's up to $180,000. Oh so that is a significant jump in three years time for the average to move that much. Mm -hmm. Historically, that's relatively unprecedented. But that is what the market has done. Wow. When is the last time we've um, reassessed businesses in, in the city? So that is, is long overdue. That is part of the, you know, the rebate. You want me to speak to that this evening or you want to wait? We could talk about it. This is something that uh, myself, uh, Mr. Sabinski, as well as Rich, uh, sat down to talk about not too long ago. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, is, when is the last time they were assessed? I believe 2012. So we are, we are coming up on a long period of time. I was willing and was ready to, I had a lot of the work done. However, that was March of 2020. And as we all know, in March of 2020, the world changed. Yeah. We had COVID. We sent the college kids home, which is a big part of our, our economy. After that, we were closing restaurants and we were closing stores. We get, you know, those people who work in those industries are now out of work. So a lot of our commercial, you know, is indeed housing, you know, either residential, you know, apartment buildings or those that are for college housing. And of course, we were short many students this year, you know, at Sony Plattsburgh. 
So I looked at the numbers again this year and was deemed that, you know, where we were at, it was better to let it ride until the economy is, is better. And I'm hoping that next year, that yes, we can do that. Okay, so we're looking at next year for, right, because your assessment period's over. That is my hope. Okay. Now, okay. part of that is, is that, you know, <laughs> Money that was given to the city as, as part of a report that was done, I believe, in 2017. 2017. 2017. The financial restructuring board report that is referring to. And, and just to be clear, money wasn't given to the city. Uh, well, but there was a resolution passed by the board correct. that said if the city were to spend this amount of money to do a full city reassessment, uh, including business and residential, uh, the city would then be reimbursed for that amount. Uh, the original amount for that in 2017 was 420,000 or something like that. Um, it would have taken a whole year and a half to do this assessment, uh, that reassessment, um, hired by a third party agency to do that work. Uh, and uh, it would, right now, where we're at with that process is reaching out to uh, the uh, FRB saying, hey, we would like to in initiate this process. Uh, one is that fund still available, and if we needed to up that fund, could we do that? Would that be uh, considering the cost of inflation? Uh, if they came back and said yes, uh, one, the money is there, uh, which would be a good start. Uh, it would be better if they said yes, the money is there, and we could adjust for inflation. That would be even better. Uh, however, uh, it would still require this council to approve a $400,000, $500,000 expenditure. Uh, with the understanding that we would be reimbursed uh, for that uh, expenditure. But it still would be, a, a, we, we've talked about this, uh, Councilor Kelly, Council Moore, we talked about this. Uh, it would still be an expenditure by the council to uh, spend that money to then, you know, the, the understanding is that with <clears throat> the reevaluation or the reassessment, you've got some that go up and then you can balance the other bits that. Out, so. Yeah, I think the beautiful thing that we'd like to see is a residential tax rate go down as a result of this. And if, if commercial establishments are, are paying a little more taxes as a result of this reassessment. Well, that is all, it's the same tax rate. It there, is. There are some states who do have a commercial tax rate in some states that have a residential tax rate. We are not one. Well, we, what I'm trying to say, I so guess, is we need $22 million a year to run the city roughly, right. or to fund the general fund at least. And um, if, if that amount of money is collected more from commercial, and that means we can lower taxes for everybody. So that's what I would like to see. And, and if, you know, those values justify that, then, then certainly. Yeah. Another thing I'd like to point out is maybe the reason why our, our assessed values are going up is because we have lower taxes in the past two years or three years. We've kept it very reasonable. And every time that your office comes up with an increase, we try to match it with a tax decrease. And that's worked out very well. And I think we see the effects of it. I think we see, you know, our property values or assessed values going up as we lower taxes. And that's the way it should be. I mean, and that makes it a good thing for those people that are looking to buy. Yeah. If they can see that the city is being responsive and not just taxing, 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 mm -hmm. then they're gonna feel better about investing in the city. Mm -hmm. I think so too. And you'll maintain the residences. Correct. Instead of people selling and moving out that we don't wanna see, obviously. Right. I remember when I moved into my neighborhood, you know, so long ago, um, for years, houses would be on the market for sale. Uh, for a very long period of time, people were moving out and I am absolutely shocked how quickly houses are selling in my neighborhood. Most of the time, houses are under contract up until this month anyway. You never know what's going to happen going forward. There's a new homeowner right there. Um, Don't you dare. Don't you dare to buy my house. <laughs> in, in single digits. Too late. 
Most yeah, houses are yeah. under contract in less than 10 days. Yeah. If you go more than 10 days, there's either usually a problem with your house or you have priced your house outside even the market that we are currently in. So that is, again, unprecedented. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, I'm gonna talk about my own house. So does that mean next year my house could be reassessed again? Based if you're on... in the old West End, I am. I'm hoping that we are close enough with the sales that have occurred in the past year versus the values that I moved things to this year, that you'll be good. Can't guarantee that. It's sounding it's, unlikely. It's, it's, <laughs> well, I, I can tell you that I can remember being in this business in 05 and 06 and 07. And the market was doing a lot of the same things then. It was year after year after year, there were increases. We're always chasing the market up. Mm -hmm. A lot of times if things turn as they did, and well, it's, you say the larger economy, you know, in 2008, but it really took almost until 2009, 2010 mm -hmm. before it ends, we chased it down. Okay. And is that the equivalent to the equalization rate within that 5% mm -hmm. equalization rate? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If I did not go out and reassess, then the state could come along and say, okay, you are not in 100% of value. So in the city, the school district is self-contained, the city is self-contained, but you as a taxpayer, when you go to pay your county taxes on the city tax bill, you would be charged a different tax rate in order to equalize things. So if your house was assessed at $100,000 and the city was 10% low everywhere, for county purposes, it would take that $100,000, it would divide it by 0.9, and that is the amount that you would be paying county taxes on. So without doing anything, you're going to be paying you know, more just because of the equalization rate. One of the reasons why we don't let that equalization rate slip is because we see huge jumps rather than small incremental jumps of reassessment. Right. Anybody who lived in the town of Plattsburgh this year um, will certainly attest that because the town of Plattsburgh, for the first time in many years, went through and, and reassessed. And it was quite shocking. Well, we saw that last year during the pandemic in Peru, was it? Oh yeah, Peru. Yeah. Right. So we saw that massive twenty something percent increase in property tax because of their equalization rate. We had more sales. So if you went back to March first of twenty nineteen to twenty twenty March first pre COVID, and then March first of twenty twenty to March first of twenty twenty one, we had more sales during COVID than we did the year prior to in the city of Platte. And that was with maybe a two month hiatus in the market, because there was at least a full month that you know you weren't allowed to sell houses or do closings or anything. So, yeah. Well, I guess even was, during COVID, it was moving. Yeah. Yeah. This points to the importance of us taking care of our side of the equation. That we need to keep our tax rates not not creating not treating these uh, assessment increases as a windfall, but making sure that we don't gouge anybody on this, that we keep our rates equivalent to some of these raises because it, it can get really expensive. Right. And most and people who are reassessed will find out if yeah. you know, the tax rate stays the same. Well, no, we want the, the other side is that we're in an upward trending market. Who knows? It's happened, like I said, 2010, you know, you could be in a downward trending market. And then you have that same money you need to leverage every year in your budget, but the pie just got smaller. When I have to go through and lower the value of people's houses, it's going to drive that tax rate right up. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And that's always what you need to keep. Well, I've mind. been a property owner for many years, and I, I have never had mine go down. Me so. either. <laughs> Me either. Well, one thing that I will say is, is that affordable housing is relatively recession proof. It is usually the high end that takes it first mm -hmm. because that's the part of the market that generally collapses first. 
And so, you know, the West End, that was one of the first neighborhoods to recover from the relatively sluggish time period. In 2019, when I went through, I knew we were moving. I didn't know how fast or how far we were moving, but I can tell you that by now, yeah, the reason that I had to go back to your neighborhood this year was so much of moving away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, in, in previous years, you've given us a percentage of increase. What is the percentage of increase that we will face this year? To the taxable value overall? Yes. I, I can get you that, but... That, that helps us make a budget, yeah. that information. Well, I can tell you that if you took the increase, it would be about $24 million and change. If you took the tax rate that you had last year in the city, you're only talking about $275,000 more. So okay. it sounds like a lot yeah. but when you actually apply the tax rate to it. So that's still not that much. That's a fraction of 1%. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you. I yep. appreciate it uh, for taking the time. So, a couple of things that come out of this is um, if it is the temperature of the council, I will certainly continue that thread of engaging the financial restructuring board, uh, getting updated numbers, and then putting forth uh, at least a discussion item, if not a resolution, to spend for uh, a citywide reassessment in partnership with our assessor uh, that could come as soon as. <laughs> We get information from the FRB on that amount of money that is available. Uh, other than that, you know, it's nice to hear that uh, the city flashback is popular. We're 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 well desired. Uh, there's no other business to come before this. Uh, uh, no other business on the agenda. There's a public comment. I don't know if you'd like to uh, speak or anybody else in the. In the uh, I'll make this brief. Uh, I'm a little dismayed. And you can sit there and not listen to me or whatever you want, but I came to you at the last council meeting and I told you that we had a candidate that not only had the support of the mayor, but the support of the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals and the support of all the members. And what you've chosen to do tonight is use your <coughs> political clout to try and control one of the independent boards in the city of Plattsburgh. We are supposed to be outside of politics. You are not supposed to try and control us in any way. We ask you, please appoint Danielle Girard to the board. We have a vacancy. We've had two meetings where we've only had four people able to vote. But you chose not to, baby, because she has a difference of opinion with you, has to do with prime. I don't know what your problem is. More than the, the lack of allowing an appointment by a mayor, which has never been denied by a council, and an appointment recommended by a full independent board, it's the danger I see that you're going to keep doing this. You're going to try and change more and more P4, 5, 6, 10 laws, however many you want to do, to take away our power so that you guys can control what you want by having only people on independent boards that will agree with you. It's very disheartening. I've worked very hard for this. We've worked very hard and dedicated our lives, many of us, to improving the city. And you can sit there and look at me and stop and say, well, I don't understand it. I've been doing this a long time. I've been protecting the city way before you were doing it. And it is just disheartening when people put their heart and soul into zoning in much the same way that I assume that you do for being on the council. You're not doing it because you're getting rich. We aren't even getting paid. And then to come here and watch you just dismiss that unanimously is just disheartening. I, I don't even know what to say anymore. I'm not going to say too much because I'll just keep losing my temper. But I am just, I, I, am, I am totally flabbergasted that you would not take the recommendation of a sitting mayor, a chairman, actually the building inspector who liked her, and the entire board and decided that you know best what's best for us. Thank you. Is there any new business to come before this committee? Yes, I'd like to make a statement. Um, I think it needs to be very clear. Um, sorry, Mr. Nolan left before he could hear this. Very clear about the process and the procedure that the mayor has set forth on how to vet uh, appointments, resolutions, 
um, and so forth, which was adopted this year with the approval of Corporation Council. Things go to a poll. They are presented to the, the committee that oversees that. Zoning in this case is public safety. And when that uh, poll came to us in our public safety committee, it was unanimously denied. Now, this shows up in this committee without a prior uh, discussion, it just reappears. So it would be extremely indelicate for us to make public statements about the reasons why we did not make the decision to move forward on this appointment. So I'm not sure why this showed up on here, unless the intention is either to embarrass the candidate or embarrass the council. Either way, I'm deeply disappointed at the method at which this was done. Mr. Nolan is very well respected. I understand that he has spent a, a tremendous amount of time um, serving the city. But the statement that we are just to rubber stamp appointments is wrong. We have made appointments in the past uh, with that idea in mind and have come to regret them. If this were merely a perfunctory practice of rubber stamping, then why are we a bicameral system? We are a, a mayor and we are a council. And this council is charged with running a multi-million dollar organization. And we need to do that very carefully. And I don't appreciate being bullied in the public. And that's all I'm gonna say about this. The item that came to this agenda was, uh, yeah, so it was created as a poll item for public safety. Um, it was reintroduced at the request of the independent board, uh, not only just by the chairperson, but as the entire board. Uh, and quite frankly, out of respect for that independent board, uh, felt it beneficial to reintroduce the item, uh, much like we would introduce an item at the recommendation of the board, uh, library board or any other independent board. So any new business? Seeing none, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Councilor Gibbs, second by Councilor Moore. Uh, we are now, oh, sorry, all in favor? Aye. Uh, we are now adjourned. That is six. Thank you.